Okay. Well, hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Hello. Thanks for attending our class on Firewise Landscaping today. Your class is going to be presented by two of our senior master gardeners, Mr. Ed Bass and Ms. Ann Heisenbuttle. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. I do have a couple of housekeeping items to communicate with you so that we're all on the same page. I have your camera on either. That's right. I'm going to eat. This presentation will be about an hour long. And we appreciate and encourage questions, and we'll do our best to address all of them at the end of the presentation. Since we have quite a number of participants today, we've muted everyone except the presenters. If you have questions, please type them into the chat window, and we'll collect them and go through them at the end. We've shortened this presentation to make it more comfortable in a virtual environment. As a result, we will not be discussing bark beetles, the effects of drought and, re and reforestation. If you have questions pertaining to these areas, please post them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to them or we'll follow up directly with you at a later date. The information presented here will be available on our Master Gardener website after this class. The link to our website is in the chat window. <clears throat> so have you all responded to the poll? If yes, Thank you very much. If not, please do that now. I'll hold it open for a few minutes. Let's see how we're doing. We've got a bunch of people. So hold on. I'm going to hold it open until 9.05. So Ed or Ann, do you have a, a firewise joke? Oh gosh, Ed? Uh, no, <laughs> nothing funny there. <laughs> yeah. Nothing funny, oh no. <laughs> Ed has a joke when we talk about the trees that are good to have in your yard. Yeah, yeah it's kind we of a talk about that one yet. <laughs> Okay. Wow, people are still answering. Too many links. I went to the one from earlier this week and I'm like, where is everybody? <laughs> then oh, I realized no. I'm in the wrong Zoom. Oh, four. Oh, you know, there. Could share my screen. Can you see my screen? I can now, yes. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. I forgot to do that. That's okay. While we're waiting, I'll just describe what that picture is. Uh, this uh, home that's encircled with uh, the purple line was a woman that lives in paradise. And what you're looking at is an aerial shot after the, the fire, um, uh, what do they call it? Fire um, in paradise two years ago. The campfire is what they call it, Ed. The campfire, yeah. Yeah. So you can see there's like three or four, maybe six houses in there, but there's three burnt foundations and three houses that, that are, are made it. And um, this house that, that survived, that's circled in purple, was built recently, uh, not terribly recently, but under the, the current modern standards so that uh, they had the eaves that were protected and a few other things. And they had the, she practiced the defensible space. So just as sort of an example of that it does work. Uh, where her neighbor's houses on either side burned down, her, her house survived. Cool. 
So we're at 9.05, so um, I think it's time that we get going. Um, I'm turning the session over to Ann Heisenbuttle at this time. Ann, take it away. Well, thank you all for attending today, and um, we look forward to questions that you may post on the chat, and we'll cover those uh, at the end. So be sure and um, identify any questions you might have as we go along. I'm a forester and a master gardener, and I'm working with Ed Bass to give you this presentation on firewise landscaping. And one thing I'll add to Ed's comments about our um, house here on the, on the opening slide is that um, modern construction standards and firewise landscaping really can improve the chances of a home's survivability but nothing is foolproof depending on weather and, and winds and intensity of fire. But um, for most fires, it, it will be able to help make a difference in um, the chances of survival of your home. So with that, we'll go on to the next slide and it's just an overview of the topics we're going to cover today. We're gonna to talk about defensible space, the vegetation around our homes and on our property, um, and the distance or proximity of that vegetation to the home. Um, in, in thinking of it in terms of space, we talk about both uh, horizontal space and vertical space, which creates ladder, ladder fuels. We'll talk about the types of plants that are better or worse to have near your home. And the main objective is really to make your defensible space lean and green. And it's not a one-time job. You know, we can um, do a lot of work this year and be ready for the fire year. And next year, we're going to have to do it again because maintenance is so essential because, as we all know, plants grow. And they shed. And um, dealing with leaves, dealing with the changing size of vegetation, all is important on a regular basis. And finally, as that uh, first illustration that first picture showed hardening the home um, improving the defensibility of the home itself can be really critical especially with regard to uh, embers that can travel long distances from a fire so um, so that's that's where we begin and we're going to start with showing you a video that was produced by the master gardeners in marin county it's very pertinent to our situation too. It's, it's brief, it's about six minutes long and um, I think you'll enjoy it. So here it is. Hi, I'm Faye Mark from the University of California Master Gardeners. Today I'm going to show you how to create and maintain a beautiful fire smart landscape. Most traditional residential landscapes include foundation plantings and large trees and shrubs near the house. We're used to this look, but it turns out there are better ways of organizing your landscape that may help protect your home when a wildfire is burning nearby. We're often asked the question, what are the safest plants? Truth is, all plants burn. When it comes to fire smart landscaping, it's much more important to consider where a plant is situated and how it is maintained than to assume some plants are better than others. The area within five feet of your house is the most critical. During a wildfire, embers can travel long distances. They tend to collect near the base of a home's exterior walls and will ignite anything that burns. To avoid that, we recommend minimizing anything that can burn in this area, including wood mulch and plants. This also means moving items like firewood, lumber, patio furniture, and garbage cans. Clearing this area of combustibles is like creating a force field that defends your home against fire. This is a whole new way to think about landscaping since many of our homes have plantings right up against the walls and foundation. Just take it step by step. Start by removing plants in front of sliding glass doors or windows and remove any wood mulch. Next, focus on taller plants under eaves and vines climbing on your house. Low-growing or ground-hugging plants are less likely to cause a problem. Just be sure they're well hydrated and free of dead or dry material. Beyond five feet from the house, it's all about maintenance. 
The goal is to create defensible space that acts as a buffer between your house and your garden. It means looking at your garden with slightly different eyes. First, you want to interrupt the path of a fire by creating horizontal and vertical spacing between plants. That sounds complicated, but it's really not. You can create horizontal space by adding stepping stones, paths, patios, or walls. Any non-combustible surface between plantings helps stop the path of a fire. They can be as simple as gravel paths or as complicated as a low stone wall. The idea is to think of your planting beds as clumps or islands with non-combustible surfaces providing separation to keep a fire from spreading along the ground. Vertical spacing is about stopping fire ladders. Fire ladders are when fire from lower plants spreads to nearby taller plants. If you stroll through your garden, are there places where shrubs are close to low tree canopies? If so, try to create space between them. Limb up trees and keep shrubs pruned. It's an easy and important way of interrupting a fire's path. The density of plantings provides another clue about how a fire could travel through your garden. You want to have a little breathing space in your garden. Consider breaking up hedges and large swaths of uninterrupted plantings to stop fire in its tracks. Another good rule of thumb is to keep low growing plants closer to the house and taller plants away from the house. Second, you want to reduce your garden's fuel load. This is a fancy way of saying, keep your garden cleaned up. Anything that burns is fuel for a fire. Diseased, dried, or overgrown trees and shrubs have more fuel than well-pruned trees and shrubs. So do weeds, leaves, and pine needles in roof gutters and debris that's gathered under decks. Keep things cleaned up to starve fire of fuel. As we like to say, don't be fuelish. Don't worry, you don't need to pick up every last leaf on the ground. Just be on the lookout for excess fuel, being extra vigilant the closer you are to your home or other built structures. Do you see plant material that would be useful for starting a campfire? If so, that's probably a good clue that it needs to be removed. Step into your garden and look up. Do you see tree branches near the roof line? Try to keep branches 10 feet from your roof or chimney and definitely not touching the walls of your house. That way you'll avoid a buildup of needles and leaves on your roof and your rain gutters. Are there any diseased, dead, or dried shrubs or trees that need to be pruned or removed? Now look down. Are paths clear of debris? Do plants look healthy and hydrated? Plants that are properly hydrated are more resistant to fire and to pests and diseases. Even some drought resistant plants may need a little supplemental water during extended dry periods. What about mulch? A layer of mulch improves soil quality, regulates soil temperature, reduces weeds, and helps retain water. Use non-combustible mulches like stone or gravel within five feet of any structure, including decks and sheds. Further out, choose larger composted wood chips and avoid applying mulch greater than two inches deep. Now let's talk about choosing plants, a favorite topic for master gardeners. We recommend plants that don't need much water, are easy to maintain, and that contribute to the ecological health of the surrounding area. We also suggest avoiding plants that are messy or invasive, like ivy and pampas grass, meaning they grow or spread so fast it's hard to keep them under control. Remember, you're trying to reduce your fuel load. Start by assessing your garden's growing conditions, such as sun exposure and climate, and then select plants that thrive in that environment. In other words, choose the right plant for the right place. That's it. Thanks for joining me, and congratulations on taking the first step towards creating a gorgeous, thriving, fire-smart landscape. Happy gardening! Okay. Um, Doris, I don't know if everybody can see me. I only see you on the screen. So, um, we're going to continue now talking about the defensible space around our home. And this slide, um, I wanted to highlight here that five foot zone around the house. Um, and as the slide says, keep your roof clear of leaves, needles, and other debris, just like we heard also in the, in the uh, video. 
And we want little or no vegetation, hardscape like rock paths and patios, and uh, no overhanging tree limbs. And one thing that's really helpful when a fire is approaching, if, you know, if we, ha if we have bad fire weather and we know um, we may be in danger, it's time to move wooden furniture, fences, brooms, wood piles, anything flammable out of that five foot zone, um, out from under your decks and get them further away from the house. So the next slide, Ed. Here we have the diagram that's on the uh, CAL FIRE web website, readyforwildfire.org. That website has all kinds of information about things that you can do um, on both your property and your home to help make it more fire safe. So CAL FIRE uh, regulations address just two zones. And the first zone is not just the five feet, but, but out to 30 feet from your house. The second zone goes 100 feet or to the property line. And, um, and so now we're gonna talk about what we need to do in those two zones. So for defensible space in the zone one, that first 30 feet from your structure, you don't need to remove all your plants, but you do need to remove dead plants, um, any dry grass and weeds, um, keep your grass mowed, Remove the dead leaves and pine needles from the yard so, uh, so there's not fuel to carry a fire up to the walls of your house. And remove things from your roof and rain gutters, as we saw in the video. Keep trees trimmed um, so that there are a minimum 10 foot distance between crowns. And if you have a couple trees in a clump and then um, an another tree 10 feet away from that clump, that's fine. You don't need to have every single tree be standing alone. Um, remove the branches, we keep uh, emphasizing that, that's on here multiple times. Um, relocate your wood pile. Don't keep your wood pile within that first 30 feet. Move it further away from your home if you can. And um, think about the plants that are in your yard and which ones you want to have there and which ones you uh, might be better off to remove and replace. The idea is to break up that horizontal and vertical uh, connection of fuels. You don't want flammable plants and shrubs near your windows. And by flammable, um, Ed's gonna cover the difference between types of plants um, that are more flammable or less. But if, if a fire were approaching and you're getting ready to evacuate your home and you have pots of plants near your window, push them away further from the house. You want to remove vegetation and items that are flammable around and under your decks and uh, because embers can catch under there and ignite them. And then um, again, keep separation between trees and shrubs and um, patio furniture, anything else that that could um, burn. In the second zone, this would extend from the 30 foot to 100 feet from your structure or your property line. You want to keep your grasses mowed to a height of no more than four inches. Make sure you have horizontal spacing between trees and shrubs or clumps of trees and shrubs and create that vertical spacing to avoid fire ladders that might carry fuel from the grass to the shrub and up into the crown of a tree. And when you remove fallen leaves, needles, uh, twigs, and all that stuff that collects on the ground, you don't need to remove every bit of it, but it's best to keep it um, to more than, no more than about three inches deep, and that's a requirement from CAL FIRE. And in both those zones, um, when you do mow on hot days, make sure you mow in the morning before 10 a.m. when it's not windy or um, extra dry. That helps prevent sparks from um, the mower uh, get, igniting the dry fuel. And always think about water quality. If you have, um, if you have a water course on your property or you know that your property is on a slope and, and what you do on your property is going to affect water downstream. 
You don't want to clear vegetation near the water it weighs down to bare soil. We want to keep something on the soil there to help prevent erosion, especially when the uh, slopes are steep. Next slide. So um, as I said uh, a minute ago, we don't need to remove everything. Um, limb up trees and the, the guidelines say to limb trees up six feet from the ground, but if it's not a mature tree or not a tall tree, you don't want to remove more than a third of the tree height. You need, uh, a, you want two thirds of that tree to be canopy so that it'll protect that tree's health and it can continue to grow. So if it's a young tree and you limit up, say four feet, and then it grows, then you, then you can eventually limit up to that six foot height. The idea is to keep your vegetation scattered in your landscape so, um, so there's no continuous fuel and to keep again the mulch no deeper than three inches. And I should point out um, on slopes, these, these guidelines need to be adjusted because you need more distance between things. Um, don't let your shrubs become ladder fuels for the trees overhead, so keep the shrubs pruned low and the trees pruned up high. And remember that um, if, a, if a shrub were to catch fire, those flames can reach three to four times the height of that shrub. So that gives you an idea how much space you need um, when the shrub is underneath a tree. So maintain your defensible space in the future. Um, that means cleaning up every year and, um, and pruning as needed. So I mentioned the horizontal spacing and um, on a slope, you need to increase those distances. Uh, this slide comes from the CAL FIRE website, Ready for Wildfire. And so you can um, find it there along with a lot of other information, but you can see how as the slope increases, you need more and more distance between um, trees and shrubs so that they don't carry fuel and ignite what's above them. Next slide. So um, for fire resistant planting, we need to remember nothing is fireproof, but some plants will burn slower than others or faster than others, depending on uh, their makeup. Follow the guidelines for defensible space when you plant and create that separation. Uh, know what grows best at your elevation and microclimate so that your plants can stay healthy and vigorous. And um, irrigation and maintenance are key factors. Um, if you have plants that need a lot of water, that wet hydrozone that's watered regularly, those can be the, the best to have closer to your house. And then um, plants that you water less often, you may want to keep a little further out in that 30 foot or 100 foot zone. So I'm now going to turn it over to Ed to continue. All right, thank you, Ann. So there's no fireproof tree uh, or plant. They'll all burn. Uh, what's, what we need to do is keep the moisture content high. So um, what has high moisture content in the leaves? Uh, deciduous trees are a good example. They're generally uh, more moist than, say, conifers. Uh, the sap is water-like as opposed to sticky uh, resinous in pines. Uh, rosemary is another one. Uh, a lot of these aromatics like rosemary, they're, they get the, the aroma in them comes from the oils. And so uh, rosemary will burn like crazy and it's not a good choice for next year house, obviously. But you know, we all like rosemary. So if you have rosemary, uh, just don't plant it right close to your house. Keep it further away and keep it cleaned up and give space around it. We want uh, plants that don't have a lot of accumulation of, of vegetation. And just because that'll keep your, you know, you want to keep up on your maintenance. So you don't want to have stuff that's going to be adding to the fuel load all the time. We like open branching habits, uh, again, for the laddering and, and fuel. Few, fewer total branches and leaves is good. And slow growing. Uh, 
Anne mentioned about the invasive plants. Uh, you know, we are the things that grow so fast that you can't keep up. And then this one seems counterintuitive, but conifers, uh, you know, you all have conifers. If you live up in the, in the hills here, you're likely to have those. And we're not saying they're all bad, but look at those mature ones the, with the thick bark, like in this picture. Um, fire can burn up to those. And if the fire's not too hot, uh, they'll scorch the bark, but not kill the tree. And uh, these pictures in the lower picture, they're um, high limbs, you know, they were limbed up higher than six feet. So the, the grass that was there didn't burn up into the limbs. So you didn't have that laddering. So mature conifers with thick bark are okay. Um, just don't want you to cut everything down like that. We talk about the right plant in the right place. Um, the plants that are planted that are good for your home and your area are going to thrive where if you get something like an example would be if you planted a, a redwood needs a lot of water and you're not giving it enough water it's going to uh, it's not going to thrive and it's going to be worse than than having something that was native so you can look at the um, the nursery can help you find this out if you're buying plants the USDA zone or the sunset climate zones, make sure you're picking out plants that are good for your area. Um, also assessing the topography, um, it'll help you in deciding where to plant things if they like to grow in uh, like shady spots or sunny spots or whatever. And the uh, Sunset Garden Book is like the Bible to the Master Gardeners. We, we all use that for looking up our plants. Um, although they're going to stop publishing that, so I don't know what we're going to do. I guess we're going to go for other sources, but there's actually a lot of websites uh, that'll help you choose plants. Uh, Cal Poly has a good one for selecting trees, and there's others. Now watch your spacing when you plant. This is really important because you bring home something from the nursery and it's like six inches across. But if you read up on it, the, maybe the tag or the nursery people told you that that tree will, or that shrub might eventually get say five feet wide. Well, so think about it and give it that five feet now when you're planting it. it it's going to look sparse at first, but if you, you crowd them in, then in a couple of years, the, um, you'll have too many plants that'll be too crowded. And you'd be making work for yourself if you plant things too close. So, so watch your spacing and even if it looks kind of bare the first year, in a few years it'll fill in. We added this to our program this year um, from PG&E. Uh, there's uh, you, the likelihood that you have like a power line uh, along the street or maybe in the back of your property or something. So pay attention to PG&E's rules. This is uh, on their PG&E website. Um, they want you to not plant in that zone, or if you plant anything in that zone, they want you to plant ground covers or uh, very low things, not, not anything tall. And they have on this, this web page that's linked there, you, you can find uh, planting suggestions from PG&E for trees that don't get too tall. Uh, and that's for the zone outside the, not, not under the lines, but next to the lines. So avoid highly flammable plants. Um, here's a picture of a rosemary. The um, rosemary on the, it's kind of, uh, Anne was cleaning this out. So she, she cut some of the outer branches away and exposed what was underneath. So there's all this kindling underneath. And then the, um, the green parts there have got that oil. So this is like um, what she was talking about when something burns, it could burn three or four uh, times the height. So this thing could be burning like, uh, I don't know how tall that is, but it could be burning six or eight feet high flames. So we were looking for like in um, pines and rosemaries and other things. And I've listed a few examples here. They have um, very volatile oils um, the aromatic leaves, uh, papery bark, and the sap is gummy or resinous. So all of these things is like just uh, kindling through a fire. 
And think about the water needs. Um, if you have in your plant groupings, you want to plant things with similar water needs. Like we like to encourage um, natives and um, drought tolerant, but also you might want things with, that have a high water need, like the, some of the pretty things that are, or, your, or your vegetable garden. Here, the, the real, what I think of is, you know, close to the water source, the things that are close to the house is also close to the water source. Those are probably the things that you're gonna water the most because they're close to the house. And further away from the house, uh, you're less likely to wanna to drag the hose. So that's a good place for your drought tolerant uh, and like that, so it's further from the house. Um, so considering the water needs and like have this little oasis close to your house is gonna be, if sparks land, they're more likely to um, not start fires. Uh, you, I, I'm not a real fan of lawns, but in this case, uh, a lawn as a buffer is, is probably a good thing. And paths, uh, you see in this picture here where they have a little gravel path, that's also going to break up um, like a fuel break. Um, patios, driveways, uh, rock walls, all could serve as fuel breaks. Um, it looks like I went the wrong way. Okay, so keep up with maintenance. Um, simple is easier to maintain than complicated. Uh, you want to prune the dead woods uh, and then flower is the same thing. You, I like my flowering plants, but after they're done flowering, you've got a lot of brown stuff. You gotta get that out of there and get it into the compost bin. And watch for fuel ladders as they are developing and things are dying. Uh, throughout the year, uh, clean up, and everything will look nice and it'll maintain your safety at the same time. Well, people like plant lists and um, when we designed this class, we were meeting in classrooms and we would print out this plant list, um, but we'll have it, um, we have a PDF on the internet and um, uh, Doris will post that in the chat so you can download this um, PDF and you'll get the list of plants. I'll just talk about a few of them. The top picture there, it looks like a shrub, but it's, um, it's not, it's this uh, Arctostophilus emerald carpet. It's a low growing manzanita. Uh, it only gets uh, like three or four inches high. Uh, it, it's, um, cascading over a rock wall, so it, it gives the appearance of being a shrub, but it's really flat. And um, there's some sedums there. There's an Echevera, the hens and chicks, and the other one's a sedum. Now you might have a hard time getting those established in um, the sun, full sun and a lot of heat. They, they take a little bit of water to get them established, so those might not be great choices depending on where you are. But anyway, there's a list of ground covers uh, flowering plants, um, there's a lavender, and uh, the other one is uh, Coreopsis. Coreopsis throws a lot of seed, and so it can get a little bit, a um, little bit much. So just, just keep an eye on that. I love irises. Irises take virtually no water. You can plant those um, far from the house, and once you get them established, they'll do fine. But after the leaves turn brown, you want to clip those off. Otherwise, you've got the fuel sitting there. Um, poppies are a good, you know, when I mentioned before about um, uh, the space, maintaining the space, uh, you've got that little six inch plant that you just brought home from the nursery and someday it's going to be six feet wide. In the meantime, you've got some blank space, throw some poppy seeds out and you'll, um, Get some poppies and once the poppies kind of start to turn ugly and mostly seed you can hit them with the weed eater and you'll get more flowers and after they're done you can hit them with the weed eater again they're perennials they'll come back shrubs um, here's the top picture is the uh, california fuchsia we saw that in another picture and the other one's a uh, looks like a lilac um, there's a, a lot of shrubs that you can plant. And again, just maintain your spacing 
and don't plant them next to the house. You know, uh, while I'm on the topic of don't plant them next to the house, besides fire, the other thing that happens when you plant next to the house is you're creating a ladder for ants and other uh, insects to enter your house. They'll crawl up the plant and find a corner somewhere or they'll crack in the wall and next thing you know they're in your house. Some tree suggestions. Fruit trees are always a good one um, because if you're pruning your fruit trees properly, you've got a lot of space there and the, they're moist and you're watering them well. But the other trees, um, maples, oaks, catalpa. I have chitalpa. That's very drought tolerant and uh, quite pretty. The little pink flowers. Um, okay. Anyway, use uh, deciduous and um, you've probably got the conifers already by nature, um, but these are things you're planting in addition. Um, and there's a pink flowering dogwood, it's quite pretty. Uh, and what's the old uh, red bud? That's a picture of a red bud and they're natives and uh, also uh, quite pretty. Red bud gives you the advantage of um, flowers in the spring and uh, red color in the fall. So it's a win-win it's a there. And here's some of our resources that you might want to look at the ready for, for wildfire.org from Cal Fire we already mentioned. Amador Fire Safe. Um, apologies to people from the other counties. We designed this originally for uh, local, uh, and uh, but when we went online, uh, I noticed we have quite a few people from El Dorado and other counties. But if you're in Amador County, I'd recommend you taking a look at that Amador Fire Safe. Um, then there's the UCCE websites for fire and uh, landscaping for fire that might be interesting. Here's something for El Dorado County, but it's also for Amador, um, Calaveras, the, the whole Central Sierra. There's a, a fellow with the Native Plant Society uh, created this list of trees and plants that are drought tolerant and also fire resistant and deer resistant. And so it's a good plant list and you can see um, his suggestions there. The uh, oakhillfiresafe.org is um, in El Dorado County, but they've got some really good information there about making your house safe for fire. And then I also, I mentioned the PG&E, uh, right place, right tree, right place, uh, is about not planting your tree under the power lines. And so now we'll open up to questions. Uh, Doris, are there any questions in the chat? There are. Um, the first one, um, it's just an acknowledgement to Jennifer Jobar. You, you wanted to know, would we have the slides available? Yes, they will be available. And I put the website where they will be located into the chat window. Um, it's on our Amador County Master Gardeners website. Next question comes from Janet Lynch. Um, and her question is, is St. John's wort highly combustible? Uh, not familiar personally, and do you know? Um, I, I think that it is on that list from El Dorado County um, in that list of resources. So you could check there, but I would expect that it would not be considered a problem plant, except for the fact that it spreads readily. So you, you want to keep it under control as far as where it's located. But, um, but it doesn't have really resinous leaves. So I, I wouldn't expect it to be a major problem. Okay. Um, Tracy did comment on that one also. Um, she says, a quick internet search did not provide any in evidence that St. John's wort is highly flammable. Some species, however, are listed as an invasive plant. Okay. Right. Um, next is from Barbara Lynch. Why the low-growing manzanita? Isn't all manzanita highly flammata? Uh, the low-growing manzanita, the emerald carpet, um, I had wondered about that myself, and I've seen it on a lot of lists, specifically that low-growing one, emerald carpet, um, as a good one in fire-safe zones. I, I've now planted it, and it's slow-growing, so and the deer don't eat it, um, so that's a plus as well. 
but I think because of its slow growth and it's um, close to the ground and it's not really resinous, um, it, it makes sense to me as a, a fire safe type plant that is okay in that you know, first 30 foot zone. Um, the larger manzanitas are uh, problematic because they do burn really hot. That wood, if you burned it in your wood stove, you know how hot um, manzanita wood burns. And um, there's a lot more dead material in the larger bushes than you'll find in that low growing manzanita, I think. So um, that's my conclusion as to why it, it is recommended. And um, in a couple of years, I'll be able to give you more uh, personal experience on that. Yeah. Um, Jerry Lynn did comment that also the emerald carpet manzanita um, brings pollinators to the garden. So there might be a reason to, to look to that. Yeah, it was really pretty in the yeah. spring. Yeah. Um, next on the list is from Lori Jagoda. She wants to know, is honeysuckle very flammable? I don't, I don't know about that one. Um, maybe Tracy will look that up while we're talking. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Jennifer Jobart would want to know, what about annual vegetable gardens and raised beds? What zone is it okay to plant those in? You know, you can plant that, um, I like to plant some of my vegetables close to the house. It, they take a lot of water and a lot of attention. So closer to the house is less walking. Now other people, their personal preferences, their vegetable gardens are farther from their house. Uh, and that's because sometimes they look ugly, uh, like in autumn. But um, it's, you know, there's a lot of water that goes in there. So it, it's wet. You would think of that in terms of the, the water use in your vegetables. Uh, so I, I think there's a personal choice, but I, I would say that, you know, it's wet. So it, being close to the house is not a bad thing there. It's just, I like to walk out my kitchen and pick herbs while I'm, uh, you know, while I'm cooking. If I live too far away, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. And, and if you think about the pictures in the video um, where they talked about uh, your plantings being like islands. You can have islands of your vegetables. So you might have peppers or tomatoes or whatever growing um, just as if you would have had flowers there. Oh, okay. And Jerry Lynn um, weighed in about the honeysuckle. She says, I do not think that Los Sonera honeysuckle is very flammable. Like everything else, just keep it under control. Prune the dead leaves, plant material, et cetera. Yeah. So I think we have a consensus there. And our consensus yeah. on vegetable gardens is, is plant it where it's most convenient for you because it gets lots of water, right? Right. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, there's a big one. Um, any, from Nikki Irvine, any other information on pollinator friendly approaches to fireproofing? Fire Safe Marin is developing a series of videos. Very good new one has just been released following up on the one we showed. It's supporting pollinators and biodiversity in a fire smart garden. Um, and there's a YouTube link here um, in the chat that everybody should be able to see. You know, ironically, um, we canceled a class that I was going to give about um, butterfly gardening and, and gardening for bees. Uh, it was just one of those logistical things because we couldn't have uh, meetings in person, so we canceled that class. Uh, I do have a plant list from that. Uh, I don't think it's published on the uh, on our website, but we could uh, work on getting that published. I, I don't. I don't think I can get it there right at this minute, but uh, I did have uh, in that list, a list of plants and the butterflies that want to um, put, you know, uh, like it's more of a caterpillar gardening, I guess. It's um, what, what plants do the caterpillars eat um, to support that? And then the, the pollinators come from, 
from those caterpillars as butterflies and what do they like to go for pollination. Okay. And then um, Tracy came back about honeysuckle and she says that looking it up at um, the website that's on the chat, um, Lucinera japonica, Japanese honeysuckle is flammable. So, um, and I just want to clarify that if you go to this website, they've listed really well plants that have a um, favorable fire performance. And so the ground cover honeysuckle was listed as having a favorable fire performance. Then continue to scroll down and it'll show you plants with an unfavorable fire performance. And that's where we find that Japanese honeysuckle. Okay. And then Lorraine Burgess would like to know how oleanders rate. Anybody know? I don't know, but I would guess it would be a more flammable uh, plant. Not, not as bad as like the rose, poor rosemary that we keep picking on, but um, it, it grows big and uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't plant it in my garden because I prefer to deal with the native plants and also uh, the flowers are poisonous. So if you have small children, that could be a problem. But uh, as far as fire safety, I don't know. And they get like about 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide or something. Yeah, I have a neighbor who has one right near his house and um, he cuts it back every year down to the ground. So he keeps it under control. But um, if you think of the plantings along highway corridors, um, that's not what I would want to have near my house. So I have a question, if you can hear me. Yes. I typed it, but I don't know how to send it. This is my first time doing this. Um, we have rosemary on a slope to keep the ground from eroding. Uh, is there any way we can keep that? It's a large amount in a very long stretch. I would say about mm, 15 feet from the house, maybe 20 at some places. Or... Uh, what I would suggest is if you can just keep it pruned and when you prune it, pay attention to what's underneath. Um, you know, the, the, what I found with the rosemary that Ed showed in the slides, the top was beautiful and green and underneath was all that dead wood. So, um, so I, I was pretty, pretty abusive. I, I ended up cutting the whole thing out. It's gone completely now, but there's new ones coming up. But what I could have done was just cut as much of that underneath stuff out and leave the, the newer branches. Um, and I would focus, is, is it on the slope below your house or above your house? Oh, I muted myself. Below. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you want to keep it pruned um, so it's lowered to the ground. Not you, you, That kind of plant below your house is going to carry a lot of heat if it burns. And all that heat radiates uphill. So you just want to keep it pruned as, as well as you can. Okay. But um, some areas have a uh, fence with roses growing on it, and then the rosemary goes down the slope. Are the roses, because they're pruned every year, going to yeah. be like a break there, maybe? Well, they won't create a fire break so much, but they will be, they're, they're a better plant to have near you. Yeah. Okay. So well, there's only one area we really need to worry. The rest of it's further from the house. Yeah, okay, you thank might, you. And you might think of putting one of the other ground covers in if you, if you decide that there's so much dead material there, you want to cut more of it out. And you can yeah. leave it you know, further down slope. Okay, all right. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Good okay. question. Barbara Lynch has another question that I think is very, very appropriate. Um, I have too many mature trees to have the recommended canopy spacing. How do I decide which ones to remove? I don't want to take out any. Yeah, that, that's a common issue up here. Um, I'll tell you how I make those decisions, and this, this just shows my personal preferences, really. But um, I would 
for the hardwoods, the oaks and the maples, I would save black oaks and cut live oaks if I had to make a choice. Um, and the reason for that is that the black oak acorn is more nutritious, so it's really good for wildlife and, and a more beneficial wildlife tree than the live oak is. Also, the live oak tends to be more, more brushy, so it's a little bit more of a fire hazard than a black oak. Um, and then with the conifers, I... I live at a, in Pine Grove, so I have sugar pine, ponderosa pine, incense cedar, and Douglas fir. And I will always save the sugar pine first. Um, and I like the ponderosa pine, but, but because there's so many more of them and they reproduce more readily, I, I would give preference to the sugar pine. I would cut as much incense cedar as I needed to to get the spacing because that is the most um, red, that is the tree that reproduces the most in shaded conditions. So we tend to end up with tons of incense cedar. And um, while I wouldn't cut them all, I would I'd cut a lot of them. <laughs> I pull them up when I find the little seedlings. So um, that's how I would make my choice. But the other thing to look at is which ones are the most healthy trees. Um, and if you have, I don't, I don't know what elevation you're at, Barbara, but um, up in this uh, mid slope area, a lot of our trees are the same age, whether they are 30 inches in diameter or 15 inches in diameter. The, the smaller tree may be the same age as the larger tree, but it's been suppressed, so it grows more slowly. So look for the healthiest trees and save those, regardless of species, and any that are um, damaged or just not growing as well, um, take those out. That, that would be how I would suggest, you know, making your decision. Okay, so Barbara responded back and said she's at 2,100 feet just up from South Fork. Would you make any um, adjustments to your recommendations? No, no, I would, I would still um, do as, as uh, you know, if you have a favorite tree, keep it, keep the healthiest ones and um, go, go from there. Okay. Okay, next on the list, um, Becky Sansoni um, provided us with some additional information. She says readyforwildfire.org has some information about fire resistant landscaping. Um, it includes a list of plants that are native and are fire re resistant. All the plants that they list are good for pollinators. So you guys should check out the website. Um, next on the list from Lorraine Burgess, are there recommended fire resistant hedges? They're on a dirt road and rely on, on the oleanders about 30 feet from the house. If we were to pull them out, what could we plant that does not grow taller than six to eight feet? Uh, I would go on the um, UCCE website, or web page, I th they think there are um, some good resources for right plant right place or a plant selector. Tracy, help me out here. Um, is it on the garden web that uh, has a there selector are, service? Yeah, so one good source might be the Arboretum All Stars, I'm thinking. So you could just Google and maybe I'll paste some of this into our chat. Um, there's a lot of good resources, so maybe I'll paste some things into chat. Okay. And the, the link that you pasted into the chat, Tracy, is that for, it was the, thanks, Becky, um, that was the ready for wild, wildfire.org link about the fire resistant landscaping. Correct, okay. with, with uh, plant recommendations. Got it. We, we also have a link on our Master Gardener page. Um, if you go to our main page, there's a box on the right hand side and it has information about um, fire safety if, um, and, and landscaping tips. Uh -huh. So, and there's it's a whole lot of links um, on that 
on that page. Okay, and I'm pasting that into the chat box right now. That's the CE Central Sierra UCN, not anyhow, living with fire. Yeah. Got right. it. Okay. Um, from Jerry Lynn to everybody, oleanders can be toxic. They're planted near ranches um, where herbiv herbivorous livestock are. I, she spent four years on an alpaca ranch and we lost a couple of animals, one of which was pregnant from them chewing on oleander leaves that were on an adjacent pro property but blown onto our property. Yeah, um, we've killed a couple of deer with ours actually. Mm. Yeah, it's an exciting thing. Okay, um, are there any other questions? Nope. Um, we got some good ones, thank you everyone. Doris, yeah. why don't you put in a plug for the next uh, class? Oh, I could probably do that. Um, on the 27th of June, we will be doing What's Bugging You? Um, it'll be our, our annual, um, integrated pest management class and it will be on zoom you'll be getting the links fairly shortly if you're on our on our um mailing list so looking forward to seeing you there thank okay. you everyone thank you for for attending thank you Good job, you guys. For those who are still on, I just wanted to mention that El Dorado County is doing bringing birds to your garden. And um, that was emailed out last week. So be looking for that. It will be um, Wednesday the 10th at 9 a.m. When I went online to try to sign up for that last night or to pre-register, I didn't find a link. Is that something that you guys are still adding, or was I was that an operator error on my end, which is always <laughs> the case? <laughs> many things. Let me cut and paste it right now because I just saw it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and you know what I think? I noticed that on our Instagram, the link was not clickable. And that got shared around. So you might have ended up with that one somehow. It was in an email format, but I don't know. But I didn't see a clickable link. Interesting. Okay. I'm going to just grab it right here and I'll cut and paste it. That's going to be a really fun class. Thank you. There it is. Right. Well, great job, Master Gardeners. You people are amazing. Thank you. Everybody go take care of your gardens. Enjoy the cool weather because it's not going to last. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Great job, Ed. Great job, Anne. Great job. Bye, guys. Doris. <laughs>